Hello and welcome to the fourth lecture in our series. Today I'm going to be talking about the development of the political and legislative obstacles to the African American community that were enacted from about the 1880s on and really lasted up until the 1960s in the southern states and these are called the Jim Crow laws, a kind of matrix of discriminatory laws that as we're going to see tried to prevent African Americans from voting and restricted access to public places. The words Jim Crow actually refer to the tradition of um, in the antebellum North before the Civil War, one of the most popular forms of entertainment was the blackface minstrel show. This was something that an Irish uh, immigrant by the name of Jim Rice had pioneered starting in about the 1820s. He had gone to the South, observed African Americans, came up with a very stereotypical vaudeville show um, portraying his impression of African Americans mixed in with a goodly dollop of racism. And so Jim Crow was one of the characters of the blackface minstrel show. and. The show, uh, what happened during the show is that these white Americans would put on ragged clothing and black their faces with cork and um, put on wigs on their heads and dance around and tell jokes and act like racist stereotypes. Um, so the sample lyrics here from the Jim Crow song, a song that dates from the 1820s, wheel about and turn about and do just so. Every time I wheel about, I jump Jim Crow. And here you see uh, the original Jim Crow depicted uh, on the right and credited to Rice. All right, so the Jim Crow laws named after this character from the minstrel show of the 1820s and after. Uh, the emergence of Jim Crow segregation laws in the American South excluded African Americans from public spaces where whites were likely to be. The idea was as long as African Americans now were free, were no longer slaves, if they had to live alongside whites in the South, they should be marginalized. And the reason that this was popular or possible is that the Supreme Court decided that these laws were legitimate. Um, the Supreme Court was the institution that really was responsible for rolling back a lot of the gains that were made during Reconstruction. A good example is the case of Hall versus DeQueer uh, from 1878. Now, Josephine DeQueer sued a Mississippi steamboat company after she was refused access to a ladies' stateroom on a ship. The way that transportation worked in the 19th century, ladies had their own separate um, transportation areas, cabins, um, train cars, where they could be kind of insulated from the rude behavior activities and smoking of men. And generally speaking, white women only were allowed to have access to these cars. Um, DeQueer was a uh, New Orleans French Creole woman. She was very, very light colored and she felt as though it was a real hardship to have to travel in the part of the steamboat that was set aside for African Americans. Um, she won damages at the state level, but then in 1878, the Supreme Court overturned the statute that had allowed her to prevail and the Supreme Court said, racial segregation can't be eliminated by a state because steamboats travel from state to state and only Congress has the right to regulate um, interstate commerce. Okay, so that was the first inroad into people being able to have access on a, um, an equal basis to public places. In 1883, the Supreme Court set a precedent for defending racial segregation policies by overturning the Civil Rights Act of 1875. And what the Supreme Court said was that uh, 
um, really you can't monitor or control what goes on at the state level. The 14th Amendment does not apply to the states. So the 14th Amendment, as you guys will recall from the first lecture, provided equal protection under the laws. But now the court is saying, no, that's not true at the state level. And in fact, segregation is lawful. Um, now, African Americans opposed segregation of transportation, but so did streetcar companies and railway companies. And it was in fact very expensive for those companies to have to have separate cars and to enforce segregation codes. If you ever study economics, you will discover that in classical economics, racial discrimination is considered to be really irrational, economically uh, speaking, because it imposes costs on companies when they try to uh, discriminate on the basis of race. Uh, Southern legislatures, though, made transportation segregation mandatory. So whether or not um, the companies wanted segregation, the legislature certainly did. Um, I was not able to find a photograph of Josephine de Queer, but what I'm showing you on the right are some children from New Orleans where there was one of the largest free people of color communities before and after the Civil War. And many of those free people of color were indeed very light skinned. So here we see Rebecca, Charlie and Rosa, just to give you an idea of what um, Josephine may also have looked like in terms of her, uh, her skin color. In, 19, er, in 1890, uh, Louisiana passed a railway segregation law and New Orleans's light complexioned African-American elite was very, very against there being a segregation law that segregated on the basis of race. They were really, really aggravated that, as I said to you in the previous lecture, um, black and white women could travel in the white cars on the um, transportation modes as long as they were caring for white clients. If they were waiting on white bosses, if they were serving uh, invalids or small children, they were kind of invisible at that point. It was only when African Americans were asserting their right to be someplace that their bodies became visible and became um, something that white passengers objected to. The big test for that 1890 segregation law came in uh, 1892 when Homer Plessy, who you see on the right side of the screen there, who was seven eighths white, purchased a first class ticket to Covington, Louisiana. He was instructed by the conductor to proceed to the colored car. Uh, he refused. He was arrested for violating the separate car act and he challenged his uh, incarceration in court, and he cited the 14th Amendment during his appeal to the Supreme Court. Uh, there's a lot more to Plessy's challenge. He said that he, as a person who was phenotypically white, as a person who appeared white, there was a property in whiteness that he was being deprived of by the conductor who told him to go to the uh, to the colored car. So here we have somebody who is recognizing that White privilege is a thing, it's a tangible thing, it's a thing that can give you certain benefits, and he attempted to introduce that into his Supreme Court case, but the Supreme Court didn't um, give any credence to that particular argument. In 1896, they ruled on Plessy's case. The famous case is called Plessy versus Ferguson, and the ruling was that it was fine to have separate uh, amenities for black and white passengers as long as they were equal. That as long as the races were treated equally just because they were separated, this was not a violation of the 14th Amendment. The justices pointed to segregated schools and said, look, we have segregated schools. We can have segregated train cars. The decision said, you know, it's a custom to segregate white and black people from each other. And so we should recognize those customs and not try to, um, not try to militate against them. 
So by 1910, all southern states mandated segregated railroad cars, street cars, waiting rooms, bathrooms, water fountains. The separate but equal theory did not provide equal accommodation for black people. They knew that just because you said separate but equal didn't mean facilities were equal. And so they protested in mass meetings and sermons, editorials, petitions, lobbying efforts. Between 1900 and 1906, streetcar boycotts took place in more than 25 Southern cities. But despite all of this, segregation spread to include just about every kind of institution that could possibly be duplicated. Um, there were whites only and coloreds only signs in stores, in restaurants, in hotels, in waiting rooms, water fountains, toilets, service counters, ticket windows, in theaters, in public parks, public libraries, city hall buildings, work sites, hospitals, clinics, asylums, prisons. Sometimes a uh, facility like a zoo or an amusement park might have a special quote Negro day when black people could come to it, but uh, often they were just reserved to white people only. Swimming pools, for example, were completely off limits to African Americans in the South. So in addition to that segregation, which as you can see here was policed by these signs, Jim Crow involved a system of racial etiquette that kind of was not written law, but grew out of this, grew out of the idea that African Americans were inferior to white people. So African Americans were expected to step off the sidewalk when they were approaching white people, giving white people the sidewalk. Black men were supposed to remove their hats and bow their heads in front of whites. They were supposed to avoid making eye contact when spoken to. They should never speak to white women. African Americans should always refer to white people as Mr., Miss, or Mrs. And in return, white people used belittling titles toward black people, such as calling everybody auntie or uncle or boy or girl. Um, so the legislative infrastructure of Jim Crow gives rise to this entire set of manners that even though African-American people strongly objected to this and found it very, very hurtful, they knew that they could not really fight against it because in addition to having the whole legal structure against them, there's also the extra legal punishment of lynching, which I'll be talking about in a subsequent lecture. And lynching was the way in which these etiquette violations were policed. Um, all of this was underpinned by the ideology of white supremacy. White supremacy, the notion that whites were superior, um, justified the United States' and many other countries' imperialism. Um, there was all kinds of spreading by European countries to Africa and China in the late 19th century. Um, mostly they were spreading to spread their profits and build up their businesses. But they also said things like, oh, we need to bring religion, we need to bring Christianity, we need to bring civilization to uh, people who are not white. The United States spread into Puerto Rico, Guam, the Philippines, and Hawaii using this notion of white supremacy as a reason. Um, white people viewed non-white people as primitive curiosities. This explains why they had special pavilions at World's Fairs where they um, displayed people of color. For example, the 1900 Paris World's Fair presented human zoos or Negro villages in which African Americans in cages were intended to represent Africans in their, quote, natural surroundings. In the St. Louis World's Fair in 1904, the Philippine Igorot, uh, Indigenous people had their own exhibit and the Apaches, the conquered Apaches, including Geronimo, were um, exploited by being displayed in a teepee village. I think really the worst example of this is Oda Benga, 
a Congolese man um, who was kind of kidnapped from his native land and he was made to live in the Bronx Zoo alongside orangutans and chimps. And ultimately, the zoo exhibit was closed after New York's black clergy protested, but Oda Benga was so um, demoralized un and unhappy that in 1916, he committed suicide. It is um, truly, truly horrible that, uh, that people were regarded in this way. Anthropologists and zoologists came up with a, quote, scientific underpinning theories of race and human evolution that said that people of color were lower down on the evolutionary scale. Scientific racists said, oh, Anglo-Saxons are the most advanced race. They just attributed all human difference, all human phenomena to racial characteristics. And they said, you know, what goes along with this is social Darwinism. So not only that white people are the most biologically advanced, but they deserve to have their positions of imperial supremacy uh, because there's a kind of survival of the fittest that goes on in the struggles among different societies. All right, so all of this is this giant ideological infrastructure, this giant infrastructure of ideas that is helping to prop up Jim Crow in the United States. Um, the people in the South, the white people, were very, very uh, concerned to protect what they called racial integrity because they believed that Anglo-Saxons were at the top of the biological totem pole they wanted to make sure that there was no racial mixing. And so anti-miscegenation laws or laws against racial mixing, laws against intermarriage were passed in the Southern states. In addition, it became necessary if you're going to have this ideology of white supremacy to figure out really who's white. And now, whereas in the early 19th century, who is white was based largely on how people behaved, whether they voted, whether they hung around mainly with white people, whether they appeared phenotypically white, you know, all of those things could qualify a person as a white person. But now um, states and uh, legislatures and the judicial system came up with this thing called the one drop rule, which is if anywhere in your ancestry, it could be uh, documented that you had a black ancestor, then you were black. No matter how white you appeared, you were still black. And so these laws to protect racial integrity um, relied on a very strict classification of what it meant uh, to be white. In South Carolina in 1895, for example, a law was passed that prohibited anyone with even one black great-grandparent to marry a white person. I should say that it wasn't just African Americans that white people were prejudiced against. In 1882, for example, Congress passed a law excluding all Chinese people from immigration to the US. Chinese people were considered to be kind of one step up from African Americans on the evolutionary ladder by the scientific racists of the time. But Americans also felt that the Chinese, because they spoke Chinese and had different habits, would never assimilate into the United States and that they formed a kind of social peril and so they should be excluded from the country. Here you see a white supremacist poster. Brass bands, cannon, flambeau torches. I wonder if those are anything like tiki torches? Transparency, skyrockets, attention, white men, grand torch light procession. So as you can see here, people were not embarrassed by the idea of white supremacy, but rather found it something to be celebrated. Okay, well, as scientific racism and Jim Crow laws and this ideology of white supremacy gained, gained credence in the South among whites, um, as white Southerners wanted to modernize, 
wanted to come up with a new South, a more economically um, competitive South, competitive with the North. Modernization in their minds went along with the exclusion of black voters. Um, the Democratic Party dominated in the South. I will talk in a much later lecture about how the Democratic Party and the Republican Party switch places on civil rights, but this really doesn't happen until the 1960s. So all through here, it's mainly the Democratic Party that is discriminatory. Um, Democrats feared that black voters could be used as pawns in competitions between white politicians. They thought that black voters wouldn't vote based on the issues, that they would be able to be bribed, that they would be corrupt. Um, so in the South, they targeted black politicians and voters and wanted to keep African-Americans away from the ballot box. Even though by the 15th Amendment, African-American men theoretically had the right to vote, white people in the South used violence, intimidation, coercion. And then if they couldn't keep people away from the polls that way, they would move polling places, not tell anybody where the voting was. They would stuff ballot boxes. They would destroy African-Americans ballots. And in 1882, South Carolina actually had something called the eight box law that required that voters place separate ballots for different issues and candidates in separate boxes. So if you fail to follow the rule and didn't put your ballot in the correct box, it wasn't counted. The Democratic Party also made it so that nobody who wasn't, who wasn't white could participate in primary elections. Um, primaries selected the candidates that would run in general elections. And in the South, after 1877, there were hardly any Republicans running. So really, the election that decided everything was the primary election. Whoever won the primary for the Democratic Party invariably won the election too. So by excluding African Americans from the primaries, they made sure that they excluded African Americans from political participation at all. Um, there were other ways to exclude African Americans from voting. There were poll taxes, and a poll tax is a, it's not uh, a tax on the poll itself, it's a head tax. It's a tax on each individual in the community. And so you had to pay this tax just by virtue of existing. If you didn't pay your poll tax, then you couldn't vote. There were literacy tests. African Americans would be required to read the state constitution and analyze its clauses, for example. And the people at the registration office, voter registration office, who were testing people on their knowledge of the Constitution would choose a very, very complicated clause for people to explain. White registrars decided who passed the tests. So if there was a poor white person who failed the literacy test, the white person who was registering voters might say, oh, you passed. Or if you were poor or illiterate and a white person, you would be saved perhaps by the grandfather clauses that many states had that said, if your grandfather could vote before 1867, then you could vote. The Supreme Court upheld measures used to disqualify black voters. In the case of Williams versus Mississippi in 1898, the court ruled that None of the ways that Mississippi was using to screen voters, neither the poll tax, nor the literacy test, nor the understanding clause, which is again, understanding parts of the state constitution, none of those was violative of the 15th amendment. So you can see again, how the Supreme Court could really pare down the meaning of these amendments. The amendment was clearly meant for African-Americans to be able to vote. However, because states control who has access to the polls, states are in charge of setting up all their own voting criteria and voting places, the Supreme Court was able to just ignore that. By 1908, there were discriminatory voting laws throughout the South. Before disenfranchisement statutes, the state of Louisiana had 130,000 black voters after the statutes were passed in that state, only 1,300 black voters remained eligible to vote. 
Before disenfranchisement, black voters were the majority in 26 Louisiana parishes. After disenfranchisement laws, African-Americans didn't make up the majority in any Louisiana parish. So you can see how these laws were extremely um, efficient in removing African-Americans from voting. You can see here the passage of Jim Crow railroad car laws and the date of black disenfranchisement in each of the former Confederate states. It's interesting to note that Tennessee, where the early Klan was founded, was one of the first states to disenfranchise black voters. The larger political context between about 1880 and 1910 was that lots of working class people were protesting the larger corporations and monopolies and bad working conditions that appeared in the United States at that point. And the removal of African Americans from political life meant that they didn't have the same impact and they weren't able to um, coalesce with white people in these working class movements. I'm going to say working class white people were just as racist as Southern wealthy white people, but it was also the fact that black people didn't have the ability to vote, didn't have the ability to influence politics that caused some of that split. The Farmers Alliance was a very, very large institution with millions of members throughout the South and the Midwest in the um, 1880s and 1890s. It was a organization of farmers that was protesting things like mortgages on farms that were um, taking away family farms, banking regulations that made it hard for farmers to keep their land, high costs levied on farmers by railroad companies that colluded with each other to set prices. And there was a separate institution called the Colored Farmers Alliance. You can see here some of the men who participated in that organization. They also tried to lobby against those kinds of um, restrictions and monopolies that they didn't like. But unlike the white farmers, they couldn't vote. So it was really hard to get laws passed to protect farmers. Um, farmers were not the only ones who attempted to sort of across racial lines cooperate to achieve a certain goal. I told you about the um, Knights of Labor the other day. The interracial alliance, though, formed between black and white farmers, disturbed Southern white Democrats in North Carolina, who by 1898 had destroyed black and white collaboration everywhere in the state except Wilmington. The population of Wilmington, North Carolina was over two thirds black. The city was also home to a thriving African-American professional class. But there was a huge race riot in 1898. Black journalist Alexander Manley wrote an editorial saying that it wasn't the case that poor black women were attacking poor white women. And, you know, it wasn't the case that African-American men were always looking for white women who didn't want to um, didn't want to go out with them, but rather that these relationships were frequently consensual, that black men and white women were consenting sexual partners. Well, the white community in Wilmington, North Carolina freaked out. They killed scores of African-Americans, destroyed their property, drove Wilmington's black majority out of the city and allowed local white people to overthrow black political leaders. To give you a tiny bit more context, um, African-Americans were accused very often of having unwanted relationships with white women. And this was one of the main things that led to African-American men being lynched or being extrajudicially murdered in the uh, turn of the century period. So this assertion um, by Manley that, you know, these lynchings were really attacking consensual relationships 
was more than the white brain could actually accommodate at that point. And, and people's minds were so blown that they uh, felt like they had to go on the offensive. Um, okay, so that's it for now. So much to talk about. And I will see you, I hope, in the discussion section of this lecture.